latitude prevailing winds and ocean currents, mountains and the nearness to the sea. Things like that determine what we call the climate, determine what the climate of a place will be. Welcome to Cambridge Zero Climate Talks with Antoinette Nestor and Amy Manrefo. Well, Amy, I have missed you, I, I, I must say, for the last week. So did you have a nice break? Yes, I did. It was really good to take some time away from a screen um, and do other things and get outside and be much more physical in life. It was really, really good. Yeah, and it, nice to come back to work feeling uh, somewhat refreshed and excited about getting on with stuff as well. So, yeah, I'm very excited about this week's programme because, well, Sunday's the International Day of World Indigenous Peoples. So mm. we put a call out, uh, tried to know all different ways, and we did get somebody from Australia to talk about what's happening there. So that's very exciting. And what about you? Uh, so this week I went to go and talk to um, Sam Button, who is an old uh, University of Cambridge student. Um, and he has been working on biodiversity on the University of the State. Um, and we've worked together a bit before. Um, so we just had a chat about that and what he's doing now, which is um, still looking at biodiversity, but from various different perspectives. Well, that's very interesting. And just because, you know, biodiversity, you know, the, the conversation as well, we're talking about biodiversity and conservation and, you know, the importance of, of wildlife. And then, mm-hmm. if, sort of, you know, we move on, on to, for example, how, how else we can sort of influence what's happening every day. I also spoke to Valeria Sembiaki, Felix Kosabi and Beth Tennyson from the Cambridge University Energy Network. And they're basically a student-led a special interest group for undergraduate and graduate students at the University of Cambridge. And they had, they, every year they have a conference, but this year, because of the lockdown, they had an energy web series, which was very mm. interesting because it was, it was a three-day event, online event, and they had people from all over the world. And Felix was telling me that they were very pleased that they got people from Africa and from Asian countries, which to them, it was a very uplifting moment. Mm. Brilliant. And it's really interesting to hear about all these initiatives and how they are, as we progress through the pandemic, how people have continued to find novel ways to do things virtually. Um, so there was so much interest at the start out of necessity of, oh, we've got this event, we have to try and work out how to do it online. And I wonder if as time goes on, you were talking about this being a web series and about the broader audience they were able to get to, if we're starting to see more kind of nuance in how those events are planned and if suddenly we're all going to become uh, online event net, uh, experts in the, <laughs> in the future and how that will change how we do things. And it's really interesting. I would say it's, I mean, it's a bit of shifting culture as well. Before it would be what has been, you know, we have spoken about it before as well, and perhaps outside a radio setting, that you, know, you don't need, really need to fly to go to a conference, especially mm. you know, in education. You can access events no matter where you are in the world. You can work remotely. But at the same time, it brings you to the issue of, well, accessibility. And interviewing um, Auntie Ro Godwin, she's in the Blue Mountains, you know, in the middle of mm-hmm. nowhere. So was, the connection was fine, but at times it just got really <clears throat> iffy and it's just, it was not the, the audio at times, it was not the best. Yes, it's there, but then how many people can actually access it? For example, if you are having issues with, let's say, in your home country and because, you know, you cannot afford, let's say, even like, you know, electricity. Yeah, you might have solar power, perhaps, but that's not going to be, it's not going to make sure that a computer can work or that you have the internet connection so but at the same time we have to think about issues of accessibility especially from places that people that you're trying to reach that because of the environment they are you still cannot reach them despite Mm. all the technology that there's around yeah absolutely so on that note who should we speak to first Shall we have the Energy Network guys first? Uh, brilliant. So, well, let's listen to them. I'm here with Valeria, Felix and Beth. So thank you very much for joining us today. And to start, would you mind telling us your name and what you do, or if you're a recent graduate, etc.? My name is Valeria. I'm an field candidate in environmental policy here at the University of Cambridge. 
And uh, together with uh, Felix and Beth, I was a uh, part of Cohen for this year. Hi, Antonia. Thanks for inviting us. Um, so my name is Felix. I'm ending my third year as a PhD student now in the material science department. Um, and in my research, I'm looking at new materials for the next generation solar cells. My name is Beth Tennyson. I'm a postdoctoral researcher uh, in the physics department. And I, similar to Felix, I'm looking at uh, next generation solar cell materials. Excellent. And to start, can you tell me what QN is and what it stands for? Um, okay, so QN stands for Cambridge University Energy Network. Um, it's basically a student society, like just like any other in the University of Cambridge. But we're a bit different from, I guess, from the rest of the other societies because we exist solely to um, create a conference, um, an annual conference every year. So we're not really like other societies which might have smaller events along the year. Um, I guess the closest one to us is probably TEDx Cambridge, in the sense that they are a society which, you know, really they just hold one conference one per year. So how did you all become involved? Valeria? Uh, I had a college mate of mine that uh, as soon as he know, knew that uh, I'm studying environmental policy, mentioned, oh, you should participate in, a, in the conference of 2020. And then I thought, why not just participating as a Yes, as a viewer, but actually participating in their hosting process. So that's how it went through. And you, Felix? Um, for me, I actually attended the conference back in 2018 as a participant. And yeah, I was quite struck by, by how well organized it was, and particularly by the, um, the collaboration between Kuen and the MBA people, which I think is quite unique in terms of conference organizing. Yeah, I thought about um, participating as an organizer in 2019, but last year I've already had a commitment at another society, so I couldn't make it and finally decided to join in this year. <laughs> Excellent. And you, Beth, have you been involved with it for much longer or is it a year to year as well? No, yeah. So 2020 was the first year that I joined and it, um, Felix was the one that had told me about it. And the appeal was, the appeal was nice because um, it, it's not just about pure science uh, and ener energy of science, but it mixes with the Judge Business School. So you get exposure to a different type of type of conference for that, which which was something that I thought was really appealing. Um, and then organizing and working with and just sort of growing your network in uh, besides just scientists and it, particularly in my field was was interesting. And Felix, how long has QN been going on for? My understanding was that I think a few years ago it used to be a pretty big society, but I think there was, um, I'm not sure what happened, but two or three years back it gradually became smaller. And yeah, I guess we're hoping it will you know, become more prominent again in the coming yeah. years. And Beth, recently you had the Energy Web Series 2020, so that's the main and that's the main conference that you talk about, the, the, the only conference in the year. So how did the Energy Series go, especially given this year that everything was going on virtual? Yeah, that was a really interesting, so we we had started planning back in November of 2019 and uh, had our initial meetings and you know, everything was sort of go ahead, being live, not even thinking, you know, the COVID-19 was on our radar. Um, and we were sourcing speakers and everything. And then once the university had announced back, back in March about the closure, we had sort of come together as a, as a group and we're like, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna cancel? Are we gonna switch to the online? And we, were, we really wanted to host it because we had put in a, quite a lot of work and we knew sort of the layout and, and the themes at that point. So we're like, no, we should, we should go for it and switch it to online. So it was a really quick turnaround of learning, you know, how Zoom web series conference works. Um, I think people worked really hard to try and get, uh, you know, the technology all right. We practiced a lot. <laughs> um, and it was, you know, it was also nice. We realized there was quite a big benefit too, because it goes beyond just Cambridge at that point, right? You can start to get an international crowd, which we ended up having in the end. Um, and I think we had almost more attendees because we were able to make it uh, uh, free as well. So I think that that, that was useful. And Valeria, I mean, you said you just joined this year. How was your experience in this whole virtual format? I suppose it was something that you were not expecting. No, no, not at all. But at the same time, I was so impressed by how when we met. I remember still was in March and we said, OK, so what should we do? 
should we cancel? Should we postpone? Should we go virtual? And in three seconds, we all agreed, yeah, let's go virtual because all of our efforts and uh, still there is an audience. And actually, we managed to reach out to so many people that uh, it's, it's actually really impressive considering everything because people had exams. I remember that all the time we were meeting, there were people say, oh, sorry, I can't join. There is an exam. So despite a pandemic, despite a coursework, we we managed to, to deliver a very good conference, in my opinion. And it's, uh, I think it was a large part of our commitment personally in the, in the topic, but also in great teamwork together. And Felix, how did you get all the academics involved? Um, for the academics, so it's mostly the Korean people who invited them based on our networks and our own personal experience on who is leading what field, basically. And we're also, of course, um, helped quite a lot by the MBA people from Judge who has Im impressively wide networks in the business world. So we were able to combine you know, um, both spheres to get some perspective from the academia, some perspective from the business, so that as Beth said earlier, you know, we can look beyond our own fields of experience. Beth and I basically live in labs day to day, so it's very nice to hear um, people talking from the business world, and I hope vice versa as well. And people talking, um, hooking on to that, did you get any feedback from the whole conference? How did people that that it went yeah we have some feedback um from quite a lot of people basically they they also expressed that it's nice to have some kind of balance between speakers from the academia and business and people also like that we um separate the teams into three different days so if people are particularly interested in a specific team then they can attend that one without you know having to spend all three days um watching our web series and they also particularly like that our speakers are very open to answering questions and having discussions. I think particularly Emily answered quite a lot of questions from her presentation. So that was really nice and that was appreciated by our audience. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think another good benefit from having this web series instead of a live event is that we get quite a lot of people from the developing world. That is something that I'm particularly proud of. So of course we were expecting people from Europe, but we ended up having a lot of people from South Asia, from African countries. And that was something which I'm really quite proud. Oh, that's, that's excellent. Con congratulations. And I imagine the, the web series is free. Yeah, it was. Beth, is there anything planned for, for the future? Um, so I, I guess there will be a 2021 uh, conference. And I think, you know, if it does have to end up being online, we would we would feel prepared to <laughs> know, knowing what we've learned um, and, you know, taking this format because, you know, we had to really change the format and seeing what worked and what didn't, because the flexibility, I think, was what people really, really liked. Um, and yeah, so I think we're, we'd be prepared for either. I think in person, it does help with particularly the networking, because I think that's what this conference was used for before, because you were able to meet with different, uh, different I guess, fields. Um, but now, so the networking aspect was a little bit down because of the online. So. You know, maybe a mixture, but it just sort of depends. But we, we would assume that it would go ahead in 2021. Suppose hybrid, sometimes they, they do work best, isn't it? Like, you know, virtual and in person. And in an ideal world, what would you like to see when it comes to energy? Or Valeria, what, what are your thoughts in relation to that? Oh, well, in an ideal world, <laughs> well, probably to reduce and have a more efficient power transmission and distribution in the grid and also to increase the non-emitting electricity and just having, in general, further electrification. And for you, feel like the same question, you know, in an ideal world, what would you like to see when it comes to energy? In the long term, a lot of renewables. Maybe I'm just being partial to my own research, but well, <laughs> um, particularly solar energy is something that I'm quite passionate in, but any kind of renewables would help really if we're really going to you know, cut down on greenhouse gases and limit warming. Um, yeah, so I guess that's in the long term, but in the short term, just really stopping new explorations of coal, I think would help by quite a lot. Um, where I come from, coal is still by far and away the most prominent source of energy. So that's something that you know, um, I care about. And you, Beth? S same question? Yeah, so uh, I, could go, I could go on for a very long time, but uh, I'll, keep it, I'll keep it brief. So um, with, you know, ideally we would want no CO2 emission uh, resources. And I think that the, uh, for me, that's what I would like to see. And um, if that's going to happen, I think it's necessary that we have 
not only behavioral change, as Valeria was saying, but also a mixture of energy solutions. Now, I am partial also to solar because I think it is such a diverse and, and um, you know, easily to exploit a resource, but I think it's not just going to be one uh, solution. And I think what I would love to see is the almost local regions using their resources that they have. So it's going to be more of a local solution. Um, and, and really, you know, I'm interested also in microgrids and more localization of energy. So um, less reliant on these like really big um, power, grid, power grids that can cause, you know, really big blackouts. So more local, much more renewables. Um, and I think diversity is going to be really important too. And are there any other points you would like our audience to hear? Is there anything else that you would like to say that I haven't asked you? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting to think because this conference, it shows you it's not just about the technology, it's also about uh, behavior and it's also about investing. You know, it's, it, it's really where and predicting what's going to happen in the future. And I think, you know, it's cr pretty clear um, it's always really hard to predict. And I think this year particularly uh, shows like, you know, we can try our best to predict behavior and changes, but, you know, we never know what's going to happen in society. And I think, uh, I think we've shown this year how adaptable you can be, not only in changing the conference, but changing your behavior, because we've had to go from working in offices to being, you know, at home. And so you can change behavior if there is a big enough push. And I think if people start looking at climate like such a, such a big behavioral change and necessity, um, energy could, could change more dramatically too. So that would be interesting. And what about you, Valeria or Felix? Anything else you want to add? Well, actually, building off what Beth just said, a big learning lesson from the conference, I believe, is how we should collaborate all together between different disciplines and industries and so on. Because I think also in the past, the big issue was that it was always uh, uh, public sector versus private sector or certain companies versus other companies. And of course, if it's just a clash and a conflict uh, to find a solution in long time, it will, will take a lot of time and resources. So finally, something that I really appreciated from the conference was that it brought together people from different fields, different industries, different backgrounds to find a common solution because it's becoming more clear that it's not anymore just uh, the climate crisis, not anymore just an issue of the next generation. It is an issue that we have to solve with our generation and keeping on postponing it, it's, it's, not, it's not working. It's quite clear. So I think like, this approach uh, to be as open to other disciplines and open to other sectors is probably the way forward. And you, Felix, as the last word? As I guess said. I would agree with what Beth said earlier. So, of course, the pandemic we're facing now is um, really horrible. But one thing that I think we can learn from this is that when we're faced with an immediate big danger right in front of us, we can actually take steps which are really unthinkable before the pandemic is here. And I'm hoping that we can, you know, do the same to the climate change problem that we have. I've heard it. I've heard climate change described as, you know, something out of a, some kind of a perfect problem because it's not very clear who is responsible for it and the danger can appear as if it's still far away, even though clearly it's not. And yeah, I'm just hoping that we can do the same and take equally um, you know, um, powerful steps to at least slow it down before it's really in front of us, like you know, the current pandemic is. And as a last question, will you all stay on for next year energy web series or as soon as you finish that's it you're basically your, your time is over in a way um for me personally next year is the final year of my phd so i'm guessing i'm i won't be very active in a lot of student societies but you know if people want to participate in organizing next year's conference then we already have a grand president for next year who i'm sure will be very happy to hear from you um, just keep an eye on our facebook page cambridge university energy network and things will be advertised there i imagine Excellent. So Valeria, <laughs> Felix and Beth, thank you very much for joining us today and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you for hosting. You thank, thank you. you. Great to be here. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Cambridge Zero Climate Talks. Amy, so with Sam, I, I believe that he was a past intern? Yeah, so Sam was uh, an undergrad student here in zoology um, and then when he graduated, he came and worked for the university for a while looking at biodiversity on the university's estate and we did some work together then and he's still doing some work 
um, thinking about how to actually improve biodiversity on the university's estate and targets and how you do targets in a rigorous way. Um, but I will not spoil the interview for you, so maybe over to Sam. Today I'm talking to Sam Buckton, who is biodiversity assistant in the environment and energy section, as well as being a past zoology student and an ex-living lab intern. Hello Sam, thanks for coming on. Thanks very much for having me on the show. That's a pleasure. So could you tell us how you first got interested in biodiversity? Mm, well, I've been interested in birds um, since I was pretty young. Um, so I've got an uncle who's a, a keen birder. Um, so he's, he's probably the person that got me interested. Um, but my, my wider interest in biodiversity is, is actually a much more recent thing. Um, so when I applied to Cambridge, Cambridge I actually applied um, for the physical natural sciences and I was thinking I'd go on to study physics. But then in, in the summer before I started the course, um, I did a, a National Trust working holiday um, at Slindon Estate in the South Downs. It's a very beautiful place. Um, we spent uh, most of the time doing various sorts of wildlife survey, um, you know, like moth trapping, uh, small mammal surveys, bird surveys. Um, and I just found that really inspiring. I, I enjoyed it um, a lot. And I think that must have influenced me because at the start of the course, I switched from the physical to the biological natural sciences. Um, so, I'm, you know, I'm eternally grateful for the flexibility of the natural sciences course to allow me to do that. Um, you know, despite not having done biology A-level. And yeah, so I uh, ended up doing zoology in third year and I've never looked back really. Um, it's a bit weird to think that in an alternative universe, I might be a, a physicist rather than a conservationist. Yeah, I know that feeling. And I would completely agree with you on the natural sciences course at Cambridge. I remember turning up and thinking that I was really into biochemistry and then also ending up in zoology. It's not quite as much as a switch from physics to zoology, but... Mm. But it's really, I, mean, I think there's huge benefits in that course and the fact that you can really find your own way through it and, mm, and, yeah, and work out the things that are actually are really interesting and the points where um, there's crosses between courses and you can actually think mm. actually there's two things that could be brought together here that I find really, really interesting. That's often where a lot of the most exciting things happen, I think, especially in science. Um, great. Mm, yeah. So... Um, we first got to know each other when you were a biodiversity intern um, at the end of your zoology degree, degree two years ago. and we worked I recognised you from somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and we worked together on um, developing a biodiversity baseline for the university. Um, I know that you're currently also working with the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust as well as the work that you're doing with Cambridge. So could you tell us a bit about what you're doing uh, there with the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust? Yes, uh, that's right. Yeah, so I'm currently on a lottery funded traineeship called the Tomorrow's Natural Leaders Programme. Um, sadly, it's the last year of the programme. Um, but it's, uh, it's aimed at 16 to 24 year olds and it essentially gives us lots of practical conservation experience and also the chance to design and lead our own public engagement projects to um, inspire other young people and communities about wildlife and conservation. So, for instance, uh, we've been working with various youth clubs um, and also York Young Offenders Institute. Um, unfortunately, during the lockdown, we weren't able to do any outdoor work. So uh, we've had to become more tech savvy and uh, adapt all our projects to a new online environment. Um, but, you know, overall, I think the programme is, is brilliant. And I really hope that Yorkshire Wildlife Trust will develop a similar youth programme in the years to come. Fantastic. So could you dig into that a little bit more and tell us about the programme that you've been working on developing, the engagement programme? You said you're working with a Young Offenders Institute. So what have you been doing with them, if you were able to share it with us? And mm. uh, what's the kind of engagement been like? Yeah, so it's it has been tricky with the, with the lockdown, I must say. But um, the aim of the project was to um, get the young offenders involved in helping to design and then implement um, a wildlife garden. Um, it was going to be um, at an old people's home, which is slightly unfortunate now given the pandemic. Um, but, you know, there are aspects of it that could still potentially go ahead. Um, but yeah, it was to try and upskill them really, and, you know, give them a kind of portfolio of skills that they can go on to, um, to then maybe actually develop a career. Great. And what have you learned from doing the project? Oh, uh, good question. Well, I've learnt um, about the importance of communication, I think. Um, communication is usually the thing that can 
uh, either you know, speed up a project or, or really slow it down. You know, if, if, if there's a breakdown in communication, then it can just really drag the project, I think. Um, I've also learned, I think, that um, there are so many you know, groups out there, whether they're youth clubs or whatever, that are just really keen to get involved. And if you just offer something, you know, they'll be really keen to take it. Um, so, yeah, definitely found that. So actually how willing people are to get involved in these mm. kind of interventions and engagements and, and that people often just want to find out more. Um, yeah, yeah, it's really heartening, I think. Yeah, that's really heartening. Okay, so changing tracks slightly, though not completely. Um, that's what you've been doing in Yorkshire. So what do you do as biodiversity assistant for the university? Mm. Yeah, so my main focus has been helping the university to put together its biodiversity action plan, um, which has just been approved today, actually, hot off the press. Um, so that's pretty exciting. And um, in particular, designing a metric that the university can use to quantify biodiversity changes on its estate. Um, and most recently, I've started actually um, implementing some of the actions in that action plan, um, such as mapping habitats on the university estate and thinking about how we can liaise with grounds maintenance teams to introduce more wildlife friendly practices. Um, it's a very varied role, uh, which I really like. I've been able to work remotely from home in York where I'm currently based. So I think it's a good example of how home working can actually be a really efficient and green way of working that cuts out a lot of unnecessary travel. Brilliant. Um, and like digging into the um, details of what you're actually doing, you mentioned their wildlife friendly maintenance practices. Um, just for our listeners, what kind of thing would that involve? Um, it's been interesting to, to do this because we've we've learned that the university is actually doing a lot already. <laughs> um, so, you know, they've been cutting down on pesticide use. Um, they've been switching to electric equipment, you know, from fossil fuel powered equipment. Um, so that kind of thing is fantastic. Um, but, you know, I'm sure there, there are other things we can do. Um, we've got a few case studies, um, places like Maddingley Rise, where Greenwich House is the kind of university's um, centre operations. We've been doing some cool things in the grounds there, like uh, creating a wildflower meadow, um, putting up bat boxes and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, I think there's there are opportunities for um, potentially relaxing the mowing regime in places, you know, that kind of thing um, to, to support wildflowers. Um, yeah, things like that. Great. That's really, really good. Um, so why is the biodiversity on its estate important for the university? Why is this something that we would want to do something about? Mm, that's, a, that's an important question. Um, we're facing a global climate and biodiversity crisis, which are intimately interlinked. And it makes sense for the university to, to match the quality of its, its own world-class conservation research by actually supporting biodiversity on its own estate. Um, so biodiversity and natural ecosystems provide tons of services to humanity. Um, you know, whether that's uh, carbon sequestration, flood mitigation, pollination, soil formation, or even just improving our mental well-being. Um, it can also be a brilliant educational resource, um, and it already informs some of the university's academic research. I really hope that the university can be a shining example to other institutions in its ambition to enhance biodiversity. Fantastic, and I hope that the Biodiversity Action Plan is going to be an example of how that can be done. Mm. Um, and the metrics that you had a role in creating it sounds great. Um, so moving on then, what does biodiversity in Cambridge currently look like? And actually, if you could talk a bit about the university, but I know that you've also been really involved in various wildlife groups around Cambridge as well. So if you could talk about the university, maybe think about the Cambridge area in general as well. Mm. I'm sure not all yeah. our listeners will just be part of the university. Definitely, yeah. So in terms of university sites, um, the, the Botanic Garden is definitely a hotspot. For biodiversity. Um, it's been very well studied over the years um, but actually places like the West Cambridge site um, is really good as well um, especially thanks to its lake uh, which is popular with wildfowl as well as dragonflies and damselflies. Um, but yeah in, in terms of the city as a whole I think as cities go I find Cambridge to be pretty good for wildlife um, and the, the recent Nat Hist Cam project uh, which was run by the Cambridge Natural History Society 
has also highlighted the abundance of wildlife even in the very heart of the city. Uh, a great example is the peregrine falcons, uh, which have adapted to Cambridge's man-made cliffs. Uh, supposedly you can sometimes see them hunting pigeons over the market square, which is awesome. Uh, it's like a David Attenborough program taking place over your head. Um, I think it's great that there are lots of nature reserves within easy reach all around Cambridge. Um, you know, I've, I've visited some of them with, um, you know, groups like the, the Cambridge Flora Group and the, um, the Cambridge Bryological Group. Um, when I was an undergrad, I tend to walk through Paradise Local Nature Reserve to Grantchester Meadows, for instance. Uh, it's easy to feel as though you've escaped into the countryside, even when you're actually still pretty close to the city centre. Um, some of the recent housing developments, such as Eddington, have also been created with biodiversity strongly in mind, which is it's really encouraging to see. Um, you know, given all that, I, I think there's there's lots more we can still do to boost biodiversity in the city. Um, it would be great if we could find ways of uh, creating better connectivity between the green spaces that we have and also do things like, you know, relaxing the mowing regime and some grassland areas to, to support wildflowers like I was talking about. Um, you know, these are some of the issues that the university is, is looking into as, as part of its biodiversity action plan. Mm. Because I suppose there's a problem with Cambridgeshire more generally, or not a problem necessarily per se, but I think we're constrained by history and the fact that it's, there's such a strong agricultural tradition in the surrounding region. So actually creating those pockets where wildlife can flourish and thinking about how we use land might be really, really important going forwards in terms of the biodiversity crisis. Mm, definitely. Uh, it's yeah, definitely worth keeping an eye on projects like the, the Great Fen project and um, you know, the yeah, efforts to link Wick and Fen to to other fen areas and that kind of thing. So yeah, there are lots of steps in the right direction. And I read recently about a um, project that might be kicking off in East Anglia that I know very little about, about some farmers who are looking at trying to replicate um, the pro rewilding project in West Sussex, but in East Anglia, mm -hmm. I think. Which yes, really that's really uh, exciting. proven very popular. And I think uh, a lot of other places are now looking to that uh, to that NEP project as a real shining example. And so I think it's gonna kick off in lots of other areas now in the UK. Yeah, I think it's going to be a fascinating one to watch. Well, Sam, that was brilliant. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we finish off? Um, I think just to kind of wrap it up, um, I, th I think it's a really exciting time in Cambridge in particular for, for biodiversity, not just because of the, um, the action plan. I mean, it's, I just think there's a real opportunity to, um, for different landowners, you know, including the university and the colleges, um, to come together to create the ecological networks of habitats that our wildlife desperately needs. And, you know, it's also exciting because we've got a brilliant opportunity to engage so many different people in wildlife and conservation, uh, from, you know, from students to researchers to, to general members of the public. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how it plays out, you know, including the, the action plan um, in the years to come. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for coming on. It's a pleasure. Thanks very much, Amy. What I really liked about his interview was that he mentioned the man-made cliffs in, in town, in Market Square, and mm. you know, seeing the, was it the Peregrine Falcon? It's yeah. the Peregrine Falcon. Yeah. Uh, no, well, they're really interesting because I remember my first year working for the university, um, going around and talking to different people, and so many different people would claim ownership of the Peregrine Falcons. They live in my college, and they live in my college, and they live in my college. I think there was only ever one pair of them. <laughs> I might be wrong. My impression is there was only ever one pair. Um, and um, and I just found it really interesting that people like them so much, and it's it's. I think, and again, with the sort of King's Well plan, I know how much we actually really do want to see wildlife in places or nature in places where we live and how it improves our quality of life and just joy and the th things that we see on our day to day. Indeed. So last week, speaking to Sarah Steele from the Museum of Zoology, and she said that they have a garden roof on top mm. of the Attenborough building, which I did not know. I mean, it's not, it's not mm. accessible, but mm. for wildflowers and bees, and it was why can we not have all roofs with flowers and have much more wildlife which is, is true I mean it's just nice you know something you, you can see the foxes but we need more as well yeah absolutely and I and I think not just from the view of people's um, psychology and the kind of well-being effects we get from it but a lot of um, the natural world around us provides us with ecosystem services that we need in order to, to survive so if we think about the rate at which we need to produce crops and the fact that 
we need pollinators to do pollination in order to produce viable food crops and that's something that the natural world provides for us so indeed and when we talk about wildlife with auntie ro goodwin so she's a palawa first nation woman from australia and her family originally comes from tasmania and then they move, move to the to the blue mountains and Yes, you know, sort of, she talks about the importance of wildlife in regenerating the, the land, the little sort of holes that the kangaroo makes, and then the seeds go into it. And all that, you know, is being lost. One is because deforestation, grazing of cattle, and at the same time, something that I did not know, that is, is all the commercial killing of kangaroos, you know, sort of kangaroo mm. meat, and how that, that is affecting her way of life and her culture mm. so you know you always have the two sides of the story that sometimes we don't think about yeah it doesn't necessarily tell, tell the full story shall we hear what she's got to say excellent auntie ro thank you very much for joining us today and for the people who are listening to our program today would you mind telling us your name and where you come from please absolutely so my name um is ro rowena um but everyone calls me Auntie Ro because I've been around for longer than I care to remember. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm only young compared to some, come on. But um, so everyone, um, because I've been teaching people for many, many years about what's happening to kangaroos and how we've got to respect the environment and, and um, respect this ancient land because it's a very old land, Australia. I people started calling me Auntie Ro and, you know, people within my mob, other Aboriginal people. And to be called an auntie is is quite a um you know, it's a quite a high status point in uh culture and society. So you're recognised and you're a highly respected person and it's a it's something that I don't take lightly. Um, that's why I've worked so hard and for so many years in, you know, helping people to understand about Aboriginal culture. And um, we all need to to listen to what Aboriginal people have got to say. Even there's a lot of because there's so many different mobs and so many fractured mobs with all the stolen generation that went on for years, and um, you get a sense of culture being fractured. So it's very important that Aboriginal people even if they feel lost or alone. And the same with people, people from any culture. Just to go out into the countryside or into the bush, take your shoes and socks off and put your feet on the ground and, and reconnect and, you know, re-establish your connection to, to country, to the environment. And I think that's a very important thing for people to do. What about your, your mother? Can you tell us more about your family history? Um, so my mob, my mother is Aboriginal and my father is Welsh. So there's a good yin and yang. So, so I identify as an Aboriginal woman and my ancestors on my mother's side are from Tasmania, from Flinders Island in Tasmania, which has a lot of history um, about the massacres inflicted upon Aboriginal people by the white man. Uh, and my ancestors were taken from Flinders Island and transported over to the mainland island of Tasmania, and some were made to stay there. Others were then put on ships and sent across to mainland Australia, where they were put to work basically as slaves or servants for the white man on, in this case, in my case, in my family's case, on a sheep and cattle station. And that uh, that station was in Albury, Wodonga, and called Wamagama Station. And that was where um, my ancestors grew up and, you know, obviously there were interracial relationships, as you do, which was kept very quiet and frowned upon, of course. But, yeah, so my mother grew up there and... Um, at the age of 16, the family had had enough, so they up and left because by then there was a lot of, you know, um, racism happening throughout Australia, um, more so than in the past. Uh, my grandfather started drinking a lot 
and there's a lot of problems with alcoholism in Indigenous communities. So they up and left and, and headed for the big smoke up into Sydney. And Mum grew up on the uh, the northern beaches of Sydney and met my father and then moved out here to the Blue Mountains in, in out into the bush. I think she felt a longing to be connected back into the bushland and be connected to wildlife and country. So uh, she and my father moved out here to the bush and uh, I've lived in the same area now for nearly 50 years. So through all the, the years, the years you can see how everything, everything has changed, has changed climate like climate-wise. So how, yeah, so how I'm has changed, climate change affected your, affected your culture? Well, uh, climate change, you've got different things. So you've got situations where you once had, and climate change, I think we have to be careful because there are a lot of triggers to climate change and human behaviour is the biggest trigger. So our greed, not necessarily our need, but our greed is what's fueling climate change. So, for example, you've got animal agriculture. Here in Australia and, and unsustainable farming industries like, you know, there's a cotton industry here in Australia and all these sorts of things, which are all water-dependent industries. So these these industries are taking huge amounts of water out of creeks and river systems um, and basically using it to water livestock or water crops. Um, so you've got big die-offs of river systems and creek systems. So, you know, big numbers of hard-hoofed, water-dependent animals that have no place being here. And they've destroyed natural water systems, um, all natural forage because they're root grazing animals and they cause soil compaction. And when you have fences going up, that also stops the migration of wildlife moving around as they naturally would, which then stops the regeneration of the bushland. So where you might have had a kangaroo, for example, munching on uh, a blueberry ash, and eating the fruits of that, and then the seeds going through the digestive system of the kangaroo and out into kangaroo poo. And, of course, the kangaroo might have travelled, you know, 400, 500 metres or something since then, had a poo, and then you have little seeds wrapped in a little fertiliser bomb ready to go off, and that doesn't happen because these animals can't travel through fences. Um, so you've got the regeneration of country that's, stopped, fully stopped, and with the livestock, you get barren wastelands. So what happens there is the surface temperature increases, which then causes dieback of natural bushland. So any sort of natural food sources that you might have been able to get, uh, any sort of plant foods, they're, they're gone, they're disappearing because of that. They just can't survive in these sorts of temperatures. What about where you are? How has this impacted your everyday life, for example, the plants you have around you? I know here where we are, we have a lot of bush tucker foods in the garden. We noticed last year for the first time in a long time, not only were we getting big dust storms blowing in from the west where the areas had been farmed to, to dirt, but we noticed a lot of dieback in our native plants here, in our bush tucker foods, and that's never happened before um, because the humidity and the temperatures were so great that they just couldn't cope. So with that, you have the situation where in Indigenous culture, all these, these trees and this country is, is part of our creation story. It's part of who we are as a culture and who we are as a people. And when these things start disappearing, then culture starts to disappear and people start to feel disengaged with the land, which then becomes a big problem. So in relation to culture and the kangaroo, is the kangaroo a particular or a special animal for your people when it comes to the creation of the world, for example? So... All plants and animals or anything really here in, on country is regarded as a totem. 
vastly different totems for different people. So some Aboriginal people might have a rock as a totem or a place or a plant or an animal. So, for example, my family's totem, I have several totems. I have a personal totem, which is a brush-tailed possum, and my family's totem is a kangaroo. So these animals predominantly surround us um, at times of birth or at some significant turning point in our life. These animals become more predominant and they're linked with stories handed down to us from, you know, aunties, uncles, elders, all these things. And, and by giving us a totem, we're then responsible for the welfare and conservation of particular those particular animals or plants. And they're an object or an animal that's believed to be ancestrally related. So if we follow the story all the way back and we listen to the teachings of elders and ancestors, then somewhere in that story there's going to be a kangaroo, for example. So in Palawa culture, I've been taught, that the kangaroo is a creator spirit, that the kangaroo created rivers and creeks and mountains as he moved across the land, the thud of the feet creating the, the rivers and the creeks. So in relation to the current situation, what is happening with the soil and with the environment? Is there anything growing at the moment? Yeah, I think you'll find... Um, I'm sure you heard about the bushfire situation over there that we went through here in Australia just recently. So one of the big things about bushfires is wildlife have always been here. Uh, Kangaroos, for a couple of million years, they've genetically evolved across millions of years to be perfectly suited to this area. And what kangaroos and your herbivores, wombats, all these things do, they're all part of a very complex and intricate chain. And they go and they regenerate the bush. So by constantly regenerating bush and aerating soils and seed dispersal and all these things and eating dry grasses, they reduce undergrowth levels of the bush, of the forest, so that if a fire was to come through, there's less to burn. And of course, if there's less to burn, then there's less fire intensity, so you get less. You would never see wildfires like you're seeing now. So when you start removing these animals from the mix and you stop that that uh, bush regeneration, for example, and you stop these animals going to areas where they, they once roamed free, you start to get a build-up on the ground of undergrowth. And this undergrowth just stays and the levels build and build and build because there's nothing moving through there to turn it or, you know, seed deposits or anything. All the creeks have dried up because of the, the farming situation and, and the, light, the big farming industries, logging industries, urbanisation, all these things. So all the waterways, the natural waterways begin to disappear. And what you create is a huge bomb essentially you've got the surface temperature increases from land clearing and this increases the heat which then dries the plants and again you've got this little tinder box that just sits there so you've got all these dried out areas you've got surface temperature increases you've got the undergrowth sitting there dry layer upon layer years and years and years of undergrowth it only takes one lightning strike in the bush or maybe, you know, people go around like these fires and the whole thing just goes off and it becomes completely uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. So do you think it's something to so do, do with education? education? And it's much more than education. For example, for example, here people, here people you know, the view is that all kangaroos, kangaroos, you know, this sort of the you know, emblem of Australia. Of Australia. And, at time, and at the same time, you know, you find in the supermarkets, in the supermarkets you, supermarkets, you find kangaroo you meat. Find but do you but tradition, do you and, and sometimes people and say, well, you know, the, say, well, you know the indigenous people indigenous eat um, kangaroo meat kangaroo there, so there, we'll just have what they have. But is that right? Is that correct? Or is a misconception that we've been sort of... Yeah, well, there's... So there's a huge 
a huge marketing campaign. So basically what, what's driving, I think, one of the main, main driving factors behind climate change is capitalism. Um, of course, you're going to get industry and financial, excuse me, interests put ahead of, of you know, leaving wildlife alone because there's no money in leaving wildlife alone. Although, interestingly, here in Australia, um, tourism is one of our biggest industries and people aren't coming here to see decimated bushland with millions of head of sheep and cattle and rice and cotton crops. They're coming here to see wildlife. And unfortunately, a lot of people are coming here and throwing their arms up and saying, where, where is everything? Mm -hmm. um, and in that, I say to people, well, our biggest industry, one of our biggest problems here is the disconnect between white Australia and um, indigenous Australia. Um, in that, we go to the commercial kangaroo killing industry, for example. So the commercial kangaroo killing industry first began as a way for the white man it was seen as a way for the white man to destroy a lot of Aboriginal culture. Their way of thinking was that if there were no kangaroos, then there'd be no culture and there'd be no food for Aboriginal people. The thing is, not all Aboriginal people eat kangaroos, just like not all girls wear pink and not all boys wear blue. Mm -hmm. Because we have that issue, or that issue, we have the cultural significance of totem. So if kangaroo, for example, is my family totem, then we are forbidden to eat kangaroo, to touch kangaroo, or to, to do anything but ensure their uh, conservation and their protection. So totem was also, if you look at totem, um, and there's a push for white Australia to adopt totem. And because totem was used as a way of conservation. So, like I say, if, if my family has kangaroos as totem, then kangaroos aren't killed. If another family has wombats as totem, then wombats aren't killed. So, white Australia didn't understand, and many, of, many still don't understand, the whole significant element of culture it is to be connected to the country and how important it is that we just leave wildlife alone and how important it is that for the survival of, of everybody that we need this wildlife to keep regenerating country and keep being able to move freely across the landscape without being tangled up in fences and shot and poisoned and all these sorts of things because you know with without the bushland um, what, what do we do? How do we live? I mean, we can have fridge, fridge fulls of meat and, and milk and, and all this food to, to eat and drink, but really, how long is that going to keep us surviving if we don't have trees and we don't have the natural landscape? And everybody can just play such an amazing role. Um, for example, we, you know, when these, these documentaries come out, like Dominion and... and you know, the documentary, the kangaroo, a love-hate story, and all these documentaries come out, don't stop, don't poo-poo it and say, oh, that rubbish, go and, go and have a look and see how these intensive industries are affecting everybody and they're going to affect our kids and our grandkids if we don't stop. We've all got to play our part in living sustainably and living with respect on this country, on all countries. And all these indigenous tribes around the world that are being hunted off their lands and their lands are being cleared to grow palm, you know, palm oil and, and all these things and soy crops and all these things. I mean, it's all well and good, like I say, you can have crops and crops and crops, but in the end, is that going to sustain the human race? Or is sitting down and listening to these knowledgeable elders and these people that have, whose tribes and culture have lasted for thousands and thousands of years. That's going to be of more benefit for us to understand how we've got to change our ways. It's not all about us. It's about everybody being together as one. It's not about 
big business up here and, and people living on the street down here, it's got to be about all of us together. And we can all do that by thinking about grow some basil in a planter box in your apartment or grow, get an allotment and grow your own veggies. Just get, get your hands dirty and get in contact with nature. And get... So as you can see, the, the interview, you know, it might cause a little bit of controversy in the sense that, you know, this is what the government has done in the past. This is perhaps this is what the, the Australian government has done now. But at the same time, I think we need to have a broader view of what is taking place, taking place with, with people all over the world. And something that we don't hear too much is about what is happening with people, indigenous peoples around the world. And mm. I thought that that would be a good idea to bring this interview today before Sunday, which is you know, celebrating the World Indigenous Day. So that's that's something that maybe will give us a bit of food for thought. So Amy, if people want to get a hold of us, they can email us at info at zero.cam.ac.uk. Amy, have a wonderful weekend. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm definitely planning on going swimming if possible. Have a lovely weekend. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.